we came up with this wedge shaped design and I got to name them stoppers, which was fun. And so you came up with the name stoppers. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> got it. <laughs> and so there's this little rivalry going on within the company, which is like hexes are better, stoppers are better. <laughs> Well, I would modestly point out that hexes have disappeared and stoppers are still around. <laughs> Pitons were revolutionary at some point in history. And then Very. ropes in literally nuts were revolutionary. Yeah. Uh, when did they really take off? Well, in the mid-60s is the short answer to that. But of course, I have a longer answer for you. Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> you got some shit. Here's my gear. trad rack. That's way too nice a gear. <laughs> well, this is, this is modern. This is like right up to the moment what I carry when I go climbing. And I'm going to show you some stuff on it that's not so much. For instance, how about where to go? Never find anything on my rack anyway. Sand cast Moak chalkstone from England, 1967. I got this, and it was my first commercial piece of clean climbing gear. I was, um, you know, I had already bought a bunch of brass machine nuts and I filed the threads out of them because I thought they might cut the runners and and was carrying those around my neck like the old um, literal machine nut off the Snowden Railway. Well, in 1966, Royal Robbins, who was pretty famous by then, went on a slideshow tour to England and he went climbing and he found out about clean climbing from the Brits who were good at it and he brought back some tools including this Sandcast Moak and several others that were being commercially made then in England and he grabbed his wife Liz and they went up and did a climb called Nutcracker in Yosemite which to this day is the most popular route in the valley. You have to line up for it now. Um, still a really cool climb, but they did it without carrying a hammer. Radical. They were only putting nuts into cracks in the rock with their fingers, and they were trusting that. Radical. Um, but you, it worked. Do you know how strong that nut is with that rope the way it is? Uh... I should probably replace the rope, but um, it's pretty strong. So like a, the It'll hold thousands of pounds. The normal nuts were only like, what, 8 to 12 kilometers? Yeah. This thing was like 20 plus. We you tested one of these? No, not one of those. It was a saddle nut. Oh, okay. It was a saddle nut, but the way the rope goes through, Yeah. the rope's so strong because it's in a loop, right? It's twice as strong yeah. as a single strand. And yeah. That's funny that that was sketchy back then, but it actually is stronger than the climbing rope itself. The, yeah. The sketchy part, of course, was the nut in the crack because... You didn't hammer it in. That's right. There was no force involved. And we were used to hammering harder the more scared we got. So this it felt sketchy to like slide this into the crack and then your rope is leveraging it. Oh, maybe not. So we quickly started the practice of putting about one third more nuts in the rock than we thought we needed or than we would have used with pitons because some of them were going to get pulled out after so nutcracker really good climb royal's friend chuck pratt who had been on the north america wall with him and the salathay and you know they're good buddies and the hottest wall climbers in the world and pratt was becoming the best free climber in yosemite along with frank sacker pratt showed up out there at the and uh he shakes his head and goes, nuts to you. And that became the title of the article. <laughs> it 
and Royal played off that in um, talking about doing that. Well, I've been climbing in the valley and for years at that point. I'm pretty serious about it. I love the thing, and my imagination got fired up by what Royal had brought back from England and demonstrated on, you know, a 5'8 plus climb. Good stout climbing. <laughs> so I immediately went out and, as I said, I got a bunch of brass machine nuts, different sizes, filed the threads out, put them on runners. I was starting to try clean climbing myself. Well, as it happened, I began guiding about that same time in the Palisades. Now, out there, there's alpine rock with the cracks have nice, well-defined edges and they're more shapely. So you could practically throw nuts into the cracks and they would, they would work, they would hold. So very quickly, I began guiding without carrying a hammer. And the other guides saw this and liked the idea. So pretty soon the whole Palisades is alive with um, what hasn't yet been coined as clean climbing. But that's what we were doing. And it, Royal was using them some in Yosemite. They were being added to a piton rack and used occasionally. And the cracks in the valley are a lot more difficult. They're flared often. and. Um, climbing harder too so um, so it wasn't advancing as much there but we were getting a lot of faith in clean climbing techniques in the palisades and then we would go to yosemite spring and fall when we weren't guiding and and take our clean gear with us and we're trying to do it so like by 1971 i did the first clean grade four the east buttress of middle cathedral rock uh, without carrying a hammer. And then the next year after that, I did the Stex Alifé without carrying a hammer. So we're trusting this technology. We're advancing the technology. About that time, I went to work for um, Chouinard Equipment Company. And what year is this? This is well, like 1970 is when I started working there. I started out as, as what I call an assistant bong bender. Like a bongs are these big three, four inch pitons for um, wide cracks. And the name comes from, they sound kind of like a cowbell when they're on, your, on your rack. They're, you have a distinctive sound when you're coming through the forest with them. And, um, so they needed a little bit of straightening and tweaking before they could be sold from after they got riveted anyway there um, you could sit out barefoot in front of the tin shed and with a cardboard box of bongs and a wood block and and just straighten them and pretty them up a little bit before they went and got sold so uh, that was my first job there just a grunt job and I but Tom Frost was working there and he and Chenard were starting to get interested in clean climbing. And of course, being gear makers, they started thinking about developing gear for it. So um, Chenard went off on one tack and Frost and I went off on another. And i show you what those were. See, these are hex-centric. This is like an improvement on the old machine nut. Gennard was hot on this design, and they came in all different sizes. And Frost and I, though, were fans of this um, wedge shape. So we came up with these, boy, this one's well worn, a lot of use, been a lot of places. Um, we came up with this wedge shape design and I got to name them Stoppers, which was fun. And so you came up with the name Stoppers? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> got it. <laughs> and so there's this little rivalry going on within the company. which like, hexes are better. Stoppers are better. <laughs> 
Well, I would modestly point out that hexes have disappeared and stoppers are still around. <laughs> they got pretty small. This is, this is a number two, in fact. It's not even the smallest one. These would only hold about 600 pounds before the wire broke. So they were more of an aid thing, but actually no, of a 30 foot, well, Glacier Point apron, so it was not a fall, but a slide that was held on one of these. Um, probably dynamic belay involved, but you know, you get the idea. Um, and we were really having fun with this. I mean, you put a blob of aluminum in the bench vise and file the sides until it got an angle that was about what you wanted and take it out and test it um, and then bring it back and modify it again. Talk about the testing. Oh, the testing, yeah. Right in iron well, once upon a time a dynamometer was this thing with its dial on it and a, a still, needle. They still have them actually. Oh, <laughs> radical. So yeah, we would take those, take the dial dynamometer out and attach it to a nut or a piton, whatever, an ice screw. We were big on ice testing at the time because, um, you know, that seemed sketchier than anything else. And a hydraulic ram and pull it out slowly. You know, there wasn't, these are not terribly dynamic tests, but, and then you were watching the dial and you just got to watch how far it went before it snapped to zero as the hardware failed. Um, <laughs> and you go, yeah, that was about 3,200 foot-pounds. This is back before kilonewtons were invented. <laughs> um, Isaac Newton hasn't been around yet. Yeah, right. <laughs> God. No, I mean, the euros... So this is all, all under the umbrella of not black diamond yet but Chinard. not black diamond Chenard equipment making this stuff in the company um yeah i mean all dozen of us at the most <laughs> it, i'm a guide so i'm off in the mountains i come down and i work for a few weeks it's fun it's exciting to yeah. be part of this development of stuff and then you know i take the latest prototypes and go back to the mountains or or we load them in the company van and, and put a hammock in the back and drive across the Mojave in the night and spend a weekend and um, you know it's the same old dirtbag lifestyle that's always existed <laughs> you just happen to be working for a hardware company instead of doing whatever construction <laughs> instead of writing software in the 50s yeah, yeah right <laughs> <laughs> clean climbing continued <laughs> <laughs> There I was, no. Uh, well, I was actually at working at Chenard Equipment once in a while and running back to the mountains to guide. I was really lucky to have a career that would keep me climbing. God, so lucky. And I got to lead all the time, you know. Tie on behind me, I'm lead. And it's all this like 5'7 stuff, which is to me still the most fun kind of climbing because it's, you it's easier to get into the flow state when you're climbing moderate stuff and you're climbing all the time so it's you know five seven is not a problem you're throwing nuts into the rock every once in a while and um anyway reminiscence yeah cool cool life still in my 20s so we developed clean climbing hardware, the stoppers, the hexcentrics for a while, and they were actually coming out commercially. They were being sold a little, but, you know, nobody basically believed in this stuff. They were cute, but um, why trust them? How could you trust them? So that being the question, um, I had the answer because I'd been guiding with them for years. I did trust them. So you're living the dream. Yeah, and, and you're I trying to convince the world these trusting are... clean yeah. protection, uh, and trust is infectious, contagious. So, meanwhile, 
Yvonne and Tom are starting to think about putting out their first real catalog for the Chouinard Equipment Company. And God, what a beauty they, they did. I mean, the aesthetics. You know, you could tell just looking at those pitons that aesthetics are really an important part of the vision of these guys. Frost, by the way, was an aerospace engineer and quit doing that in order to make climbing hardware and so that he could go climbing more often. Very smart decision. <laughs> <laughs> Dirtbag <laughs> to the core. All right, so they're getting ready to put out this catalog and the catalog is going to have in it all this new clean climbing hardware. Where is it? Come on. Stoppers. Hexcentrics. Radical stuff. And those guys were totally sold on it by then, so they bet the farm on this new hardware. They're a piton maker. That's where their money's coming from. They put all their money into dies. I mean, that's an expensive die, each size. Um, and it's easy to get dirt bags to cut them off with a hacksaw and polish them and stuff but but uh, you have to have the die first to make it happen um, so they bet the farm on clean climbing and this is like really an exciting people period there maybe a dozen people work in there but most part-time and is this the biggest climbing company around at this point oh yeah <laughs> yeah oh yeah so so we're talking about this whole thing and they decide that it's really it's going to be a good idea to have a um, to explain themselves explain ourselves so i wrote <laughs> some of my dad's notes in here <laughs> <laughs> just kind of sweet now that he's gone but um, he was an engineer an aerospace engineer too so he really understood what we were doing anyway I got to write the manifesto for clean climbing the and Jeanard named it the whole natural art of protection which I thought was a really cool name um, this is a team effort a lot of ways but I got to write this thing that um, I'll just read you a couple lines. This is the way it starts out. There is a word for it, and the word is clean. Climbing with only nuts and runners for protection is clean climbing. Clean because the rock is left unaltered by the passing climber. Clean because nothing is hammered into the rock and then hammered back out, leaving the rock scarred and the next climber's experience less natural. Clean because the climber's protection leaves little track of his ascension. Clean is climbing the rock without changing it. A step closer to organic climbing for the natural man. Ah. Goes on. It's mostly technique, like how to place nuts, how to know that they're strong. Um, doing things like uh, you got a horizontal crack at your belay ledge, you're a thousand feet in the air, all you can do is put one nut in this that's pulling this way and one nut in that's pulling this way, but you can figure out how to wire them together and pull them towards each other so that you get an omnidirectional anchor by very directional pieces that are pulled in the wrong directions. <laughs> so, you know, I'm just like gleeful we're, we're inventing this how to make it work stuff that truthfully was a lot harder then than um, than once cams came along but i'm jumping ahead a little with cams because where this is still 1972 but we're um, pulling off the north face of sentinel rock the uh, stex alathe without carrying hammers and feeling pretty bold about ourselves and the catalog came out. The bet is working out because people are starting to buy this stuff a little. We need some impetus. Along comes Galen Rowell. He's not a famous photojournalist yet. He's a greasy Chevy mechanic. And he 
bet the farm too actually he sold his chevy shop he had enough money he figured to make it 18 months he had two kids at this point i mean this is like he did bet the farm and luckily he got a <laughs> he got an assignment from national geographic not bad to do a sidebar to an article about Yosemite. So they're doing a major article about Yosemite. Yeah, do a big wall and we'll give you a couple pages and stuff. So he came to me and to Dennis Hennick and said, hey, you want to come along? Well, Dennis Hennick and I happened to have been doing first ascents, five tens, only with nuts for protection. So he, I don't know if Galen was even aware of this, but, but we went, sure, as long as we can try to do it clean. And Galen goes, yeah, whatever. Um, we'll put some pins and a hammer in the bottom of the haul bag. And in case you guys can't pull off this clean thing, you know, clean, that's what you call it. Um, we'll be able to get up the wall and I'll get my, my uh, story. So, okay. Giant steamer trunk arrives from National Geographic. It's full of Nikons and film and go ah well we don't know about that stuff galen you sort out the cameras we'll sort the hardware and we left out the pins and the hardware <laughs> and the hammer <laughs> and we didn't tell him till the third pitch he was really a good sport about it i gotta say because um <laughs> he knew that we were had faith in this and we knew that we had it totally wired which it turned out we did um, and we got up the thing in three days, and his photos landed on the desk of the photo editor at National Geographic, and suddenly it became the cover story. <laughs> and the, the major story about Yosemite is sort of added on to it because his photos were so good. You know, and he's a photojournalist. He's, um, even then, he was good at what he did, and he wrote the story, too even said, Doug's ideal is a mountain goat. Okay, I guess that works, because they're pretty damn good climbers. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, that's Dennis Hennick on the cover. And there's me, long hair, <laughs> starting to lead one of the crux pitches uh, halfway up the wall, which we did free. We, we freed 81% of the climbing up to 10a or so which wasn't being done on walls then but you know i wasn't a wall climber i didn't know that you weren't supposed to climb like that <laughs> i thought free climbing was fun <laughs> so we were doing it and okay one more tiny story before i give you the punchline on this because they national geographic is so good they sent around the proofs of this to us to look at and said you know any any questions any concerns and i said the article is really good the photos are good the captions are good but your title and they had conquering half dome the hard way i said you know the idea of conquest is anathema to climbers we never claim that we feel lucky if we can slip through the defenses of the mountain and get up something and and approach it humbly or if, if you're not humble you might get chopped so they changed the title you know that's really responsive i've worked for a lot of magazines it doesn't always happen <laughs> Okay, so the punchline is that it doesn't hurt to have a circulation of 15 million or so, and it, this slam dunked the clean climbing revolution. Not what we did, but the publicity generated by it, right? It, and within a few months, you literally could not be caught slinking out of Camp 4 with a hammer on. It was that fast. People, everybody got on board. Thank you, National Geographic. <laughs> when did you create your stoppers to the point of when did this take off? Oh, what was well, that time frame? the stoppers were, we had them pretty dialed by 70, maybe 71. Okay. And... And 74, this comes out. And, uh, and Hexcentrics by a year later, because the molds were more expensive for them. So 74, we had all that stuff. And 
I will show you one other piece of hardware that turned out to be crucial that Tom Frost, genius guy, invented. Um, hold that thought though. So, 74, the clean climbing revolution was over by the end of that summer. Um, everybody had bought into it, and we can get into cams, I mean, I, which are huge and I important. Mean, I have the best cams ever invented, and five tens in Yosemite scare the shit out of me. Yeah. <laughs> That's amazing. Me too. <laughs> because your shoes back then. Yeah. Your yeah. shoes back then were what? Still boots? Well, they were boots, yeah, when we started. Um, <clears throat> literal did, boots. When did EBs come out? My first season when, that I spent all summer in Yosemite, I was climbing in mountain boots. Wow. You did tens in mountain boots on nines? No, no. That was eights and nines. Oh, that was this, oh eights and nines. Yeah, in Easy. mountain boots. <laughs> I mean, they were pretty damn good for dime edges. They sure are. You know? Uh, yeah. <laughs> they rock on that yeah. terrain. But... And then we had clutter shoes, which was like a, a one-layer boot, ankle high, um, with a thin rubber sole. Still was a lug sole, but you got more feel of the rock through those, and they were really the hot ticket. They were the best that we had. Clutter shoes, Austrian, good ones, Zillertals. Uh, and there were two or three different kinds. Robbins had a different one that he liked better. And, um, Pratt had another different one, and since he was the leading crack climber and I was trying to apprentice to him, then I immediately went and bought the, sh same, the shoes he had, which were the same shoes that my mom chose to hike in. I mean, this is not high tech here, <laughs> except we bought them tighter. <clears throat> okay, so back to Half Dome for a moment. You ever seen one of these? No. I mean, there very few of them were made. It's, oh, look, it says Diamond C on it. Cool. This is a cracking up. <laughs> this is a Tom Frost invention. The idea was, and this is the fat one, you can see, but it's got a little bit of a tapered face on the end of it, and you can see it on the big one, but on, once you get down to the, to the tiny one, you can hardly see the taper, but it's a little bit ground on there. Um, the idea was that the smallest stoppers would fit down to where you could get a wire through them, but that's as small as they could get. But there are cracks smaller than that. Frost could see this. And so, mainly for aid climbing, he developed cracking ups. And you slide this into the crack in the rock. It's a little bit offset, so it's got some camming action. And it's got the nut face on it. It's really clever. Towards the top of Half Dome, the last difficult pitch was an aid pitch. It's free now at 512. And there's Alex Honnold tells an incredible story about working on soloing that, the 12 moves up there. But, you know, this was back in the easy days when we, we could aid stuff and nobody cared. Um, these proved crucial. It was the old A4 pitch, you know, that's downgraded now. It's probably A2 plus, <laughs> but but it, it was hard at the time, and it was hard partly because the best parts of the crack had um, leftover bashies in there with rotten slings on them. Well, we weren't touching any of the pitons on the route. You know, we were being purists, and so to get in the pieces of the crack that were in between these old bashies, we had to use frosts, cracking ups, and it's the only thing that allowed us to get all the way up that wall without touching a piton. Actually, Galen clipped a piton in the zigzags. He didn't know any better, and we, uh, <laughs> we didn't feel like at that point we needed to pull a rope and go down and climb it clean, because whatever. But um, anyway... Yeah, cracking ups, brilliant, and, but only made for a little while. And this was a product that, let's say, did not make a million dollars. What what replaced these? Like they're obviously valuable. Oh. What made them not continue? Well, what replaced them is unfortunately kind of retro because big wall climbers kept using pitons. Ah. Uh. 
um, because they were used, they were working shallow cracks and flared cracks, and they were stacking pitons. I mean, they were yeah. there was a different game than free climbing with clean gear. So they had a thing. I forget what it's called, but it's like half of a kraken up like this beaks. with a hammer face beaks. Yeah, yeah. Um, and you could tap it in with your hammer, which makes you feel better. Certainly and, does. And it, they work with the number five. If you hit them with the number five, if that's all you have, it makes you feel better. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, hitting them with things was certainly going on. And I had, uh, I would, I climbed with a few people who, after a climb or two, I didn't climb with anymore because they bashed on my beautiful rack of nuts. <laughs> They didn't know you good enough to not <laughs> hammer in your nuts. Like <laughs> you're the clean guy, <laughs> Mr. Father of Clean Climbing. I'll just bash on your nuts. Here. <laughs> You've heard of simultaneous invention in like science and engineering, where the times are ripe and people come up with the same idea, but they don't know each other. Well, clean climbing turned out to be the same thing. Mm. Although it took us a long time to know it. But in the Shuang Gunks in New York, the good old Gunks, a Brit actually in the late 50s moved to New York City for his work. And I don't know what it was, but his name was Michael Westmacott. He was on the famous 53 Everest expedition, the first one to succeed. So he was an all around mountaineer, but he knew nuts from England and brought them to the gunks. So we're talking the early 60s when they got to the gunks. Now there's no communication between the East Coast and the West Coast, so we had no idea what was going on out there, but um, he was quietly climbing stuff clean. And John Stannard, who became one of the stars of that era in free climbing in the gunks, pushing 510, got really into nuts also. And so he was doing clean protection on his hard new routes. And we didn't, we had no idea here. So we're developing it here. They're developing getting in the gunks. It took, well, just before, while I was writing, in fact, the clean climbing manifesto, if you will, Chenard hands me this copy of a thing called the Eastern Trade, which is just a few pieces of paper. But John Stannard wrote it, and it was proselytizing for using clean protection in the Shuangunks. And I wow, looked at this thing. Wow, this is really cool. These guys are doing it too. This is reinforcement for what we're about, what we're trying to push. Um, and I unfortunately I did not mention it in the manifesto. I wish I had now because I... I take every opportunity I can to give John Stannard and Michael Westmacott all the credit that they are due for simultaneously inventing this way cool technology and pushing it so hard. They were climbing this hard, like 510 was as hard as it got then, you know. Yosemite, the gunks, same difficulty ratings, clean protection. Pretty cool. Were, were, were you living in Bishop? I was living in Bishop I, and... I remember reading about this years ago and something about Lynn Hill or something was with you. Basically, you guys were looking at that East Coast pamphlet that you got. Really? And yeah, I remember reading this huh. it, and essentially you were just like, you had Summit and Summit was basically a mountaineering magazine, not a climbing magazine. Right. So to get this little pamphlet just like re-emphasized everything you were doing. Yeah. And it said, you, you didn't even meet him until a decade or two later or something? I or still more? haven't met him, but we've corresponded a little and we've, <laughs> we're going to do a video interview together. Um, awesome. Maybe in the next year, I'm hoping. And because he... I'm really anxious to talk to him about this stuff. Like I heard about Michael Westmacott only in the last year from Joe Kelsey, who was one of the Bulgarians who were active in the gunks at the time. <laughs> or, or I wouldn't even know that part of the story. The British connection there, the British connection to Royal Robins, come bringing clean gear to the valley. You know, it's 
it's really cool. This is coming together. So I'm really looking forward to talking to John Stannard about it face to face on tape and see what he has to say. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Simultaneous it, invention. The simultaneous invention happens so often in highlining. Really? So often in highlining. Huh. And uh, it's hard to know who gets credit for stuff, actually, because it's happening all the time. To even today, we invented something for the world record project we just did. Huh. That somebody else is like, oh, this is my design I'm currently working on. <laughs> it's like these Z drags. It's like, Phew. You mean the not really a world record because it's only one tenth longer? It's only 300 feet longer. <laughs> <laughs> Hashtag not a world record. Yeah, right. <laughs> uh, well, I can't wait to hear what you think of this as somebody who really pushed clean climbing well yeah clean climbing was was advancing yosemite climbing because it was faster to be able to get a nut off your rack and slot it instead of taking a piton off putting it in the crack till it just barely holds and then where's my hammer and hitting it and hoping the first hit doesn't knock it out of the crack and, um so nuts were faster and with energy dependent climbs these the harder and harder crack climbs that are getting done in the valley and now we're edging into 511 in the 70s um, it's an advantage well 1977 there was a guy ray jardine who came up with these things, spring-loaded camming devices. His name for them was Friends. It was brilliant, you know, almost as good as stoppers. It, uh, <laughs> I shouldn't say stuff like that. Because um, Jardine was brilliant. I mean, he really, and but he didn't have his patent yet. So he had his rack of handmade friends under his coat, leaving Camp 4, and his partner sworn to secrecy, and they were going out. And what's faster than putting a stopper into a crack? It's plug and play. <laughs> and uh, so Jardine, interestingly enough, uh, up the standards more than anyone else could at the time. And training had come into the valley. The backer ladders were all set up. People were injuring their elbows, trying to train too hard. Um, and it was a tech ad advancement that actually upped the standards more than you could by being ruthlessly strong which had really come in, you know, in the 60s, we thought training was unsporting and behaved that way, but whatever. Um, Jardine was not only training, but he had invented friends and was slinking around with them until his patent came out and he could be sure that, well, thanks to that patent, he bought a sailboat and sailed off to the South Seas after raising the standards to 513 in the valley, unheard of. I mean, he literally added a number grade, not just another ladder or two, but a number grade from 12 to 13. It never happened before, never happened since in Yosemite or anywhere else that I know of. And it was thanks to this, um, the solid stem is like a teehee now, it looks so retro. But the genius of it is not the stem, it's not the trigger, it's the shape. This is a logarithmic spiral. And I don't know to this day, I guess I don't know enough math, but to understand why you could <clears throat> get a holding angle when it's all the way compressed or when it's almost all the way open that it holds equally well. That's because this is a logarithmic curve on the cam, okay? This stuff I'll never understand, but for what it's worth, there it is. That's the genius of this thing. It's one of the, well, it's fast, it's plug and play. <clears throat>
1977 revolutionized Yosemite, revolutionized climbing all over the world. But Yosemite is where it happened. And, you know, it's the coolest climbing area on Earth, so it's a good thing that it happened there. And that Jardine did it. And hats off, I don't even have my hat on, but hats off to you, Ray Jardine, for doing this. He did some other stuff that was maybe sketchier, like chipping holds on the nose of El Cap because he was a little too eager to make the first free ascent, and he didn't anyway. Genius, thank you. Left the valley, sailed off to the South Seas. You know what else happened? Nobody knows this in the climbing world. He came back, quit sailing. It's kind of boring being confined to a sailboat, I guess. I've heard that from a bunch of people. Um, he came back and he invented ultralight backpacking. He became a through hiker and he published a book where he was urging you to get out your sewing machine, cut nylon, you can make way lighter gear than any of this stuff like the seven pound internal frame pack was a big deal then and everybody was carrying them because nobody knew any better. Um, with Jardine, knew better and he gave patterns for this stuff he didn't start go light or you know whatever company and make more millions because he'd already made his millions on friends he didn't need the money and he was smart enough to go for experience instead of dollars so he is considered a god among through hikers he literally wrote the book about how to make that gear and then other people like Go light, for instance, um, actually made the gear. The some of it wasn't such hot gear. Wayne Gregory, my pack making friend, I made stuff for him, like the first carbon fiber stays that were put in the backpack, and um, so we had fun together doing that. But I couldn't talk him into ultralight. He was still the king of the seven pound backpacks. <laughs> oh, sorry, Wayne, but. Um, these other guys were smart about it. They were sort of smart about it. They did what, what Gregory called a pillowcase with shoulder straps. <laughs> and yeah, they were light, but they didn't carry well at all. But it didn't matter if you had 14 pounds on your back and you got a resupply every three days. Uh, it actually made no difference because through hiking is this whole different thing than like backpacking into a month-long expedition where you actually need a hefty carrying system. So um, I guess I'm a pack designer so too, so I guess I had to tell that story because <laughs> I actually have made ultralight packs that, that really carry and that you can carry 40 or 50 pounds in, but um, that's a whole different story and not part of what we're doing here. So friends, <laughs> Um, and the improvement on Friends, thanks to um, Black Diamond, formerly Chenard Equipment Company, same trigger, same plug and play, same curve, especially after the patent wore off. Uh, I mean, and, and the two axle design, that's actually how they got around the patent. And it does have a larger throw than Friends did. So it was an improvement, like one piece will fit a wider selection of cracks. So pretty genius. Um, and yeah, these are the latest ones they got. Here, where's the bigger one? The, the hole patterns in them, this, this is brand new, they're lighter. But they work in exactly the same way. Flexible stems are handy. Very handy, in fact. Flex in any direction. Big improvement. But essentially the same kind of device, right? Um, the Camelots, they called them. They're half a dozen different manufacturers. I don't know, maybe they're only two or three now. A lot of shakeout and people in garages like, like these. Whoa, not that one. Aliens. People in garages. Aliens are really cool because they managed to make them. I mean, look how small this guy is. This is a barely much range of fitting size, but 
I bought these two as soon as they came out because I knew the exact place that I wanted to put them and there was a 40 foot run out if you didn't have this guy. <laughs> and they flex. <laughs> they flex. The In fact, they flex too much because the <laughs> axle flex bent under some falls. Uh -huh. And the uh, guys in the garage went, oh, wait, wait, we're going to get sued. And so they quit making them <laughs> and sold the name to somebody else. and. They're, I, don't, I forget who's making them now, but you can't keep track of all the garages out there. Um, but anyway, this like as small as a cam gets, so you still need the small stoppers. And I guess just to finish up the story of clean climbing, Tom Frost comes back after going off and having a very successful company called Chimera that was doing lighting for... Hollywood, like soft lighting, get that chick looking good. Um, and he sold that company, came back, and started making stopper-like things again. They're called Sentinels. They have uh, a steeper angle to them. We debated back and forth so much on the angle, but steeper angle than than the. Um, than a stopper does. You can see the difference. It's only one or two degrees. Um, sentinel nuts, because everybody's so fond of Sentinel Rock and the Styx Alethe climb that was the big deal in our history and still a high water mark in anyone's climbing career to get up that sucker. Badass climb. Um, let me show you. There's, I've got some larger. There we go. There's a bigger Sentinel. He put all of his out on wire, um, but he actually okayed me to cut the wire, drill them out, put cord on them. See, I like the flexibility here because the problem of it being leveraged out of the crack behind you is the same old problem that we always had with wires. Um, so I just Nobody else does this, but I just had to say this because I think it's cool and I kind of like it when my pro stays in the crack behind me. It's a good thing. Um, gosh, I think that brings clean climbing protection all the way up to the present. It's mostly cams nowadays. Even I use them a lot because I get lazy and it's <laughs> plug and play. <laughs> Well, it's they stay in the rock even better than the stoppers do. <laughs> Ray Jardine made the, he was a rocket scientist too, wasn't he? He was some super. I, I think I he, was, right, he was. Yeah, he was a rocket scientist. Yes, which doesn't surprise me. No kidding. Right? Oh my God. And then <laughs> he used right the climb that the hardest climb in the world, Grand Illusion. It's only possible because of those friends, Suzuki. What are they? Hedy Tata yeah, things? but he didn't put it up. That was Tony, um, Tony, Tony Nero? Nero. Yeah. Tony put it up and then Suzuki got it. And he, yeah. tra and he trained a Kasume on Dinkum for it. Really? Yeah. He said a 40 pound pack and would just do laps on Dinkum. Wow. Like Kasume. That was his training for Grand Illusion. Like, oh, that's so I'm interesting. I'm not going to get good enough doing that. Yeah. A yeah, 5.9 yeah. to a 13? Like, what? Yeah. Huh. <laughs> Maybe that huh. pack really does something. <laughs> yeah. Boy. How many years were friends the only cams out there because of the patent i'm not going to be able to give you a good answer to that it was like is it, a it was five or more it might have been 10 um but i mean ever you had to have friends yeah. right away it was as revolutionary as sticky rubber was in 83 so what did Sticky Rubber and Friends do for your personal climbing level? Were you able to just <laughs> jump? Oh, yeah. Because you were strong with yeah, I was strong. boots and nuts. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had rock shoes by then. I had EBs. But, man, as soon as the fee race came along, the EBs went in the trash because <laughs> the Sticky Rubber was, was like a, a one-hole grade jump. In some people's estimations, I don't think I jumped a grade, but I was getting old by then. Um, I must have been in my 30s.
as a 75 year old is 30s old should i be concerned <laughs> be afraid I'm half your be age very afraid i'm less than half your age and i'm old yeah, yeah. I, I just turned 38 <laughs> yeah no nothing about that but i mean i'm joking but it, sort of <laughs> i guess if you're a s- sport climber and you're trying to climb 15s you know maybe 30 32 is the cutoff now i don't i don't even know i don't care i still get to climb i get to climb five sevens all day long and it pulls me into the flow state which is really why i climb because it's like um the headspace it's not the headspace of pulling off a 511 anymore or whatever your limit is you, you want know. to try highlining 11 for me oh. i'm scared because <laughs> <laughs> if you like flow state i got something for you i actually have tried you know like slack landing two yeah. feet off the ground and it it really is it's big <laughs> respect for what you guys do big respect well i can't climb five tens if my life depended on it so <laughs> big respect in boots in With boots nuts. yeah or alien cams you know, in the end, it doesn't matter what your discipline is. Yeah. It's doing a discipline and having maybe enough discipline to go out all the time. And I probably climbed 5'7 only three times in the last week and not very many pitches of it. But, um, but Emigrant Wall was one of those times, you know, and yeah, we did did the 5.8 route out there. I had to put on my rock shoes, not my approach shoes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so about shoes, like, oh, about what was shoes. your history on that? Well, started climbing in mountain boots. Then I got clutter shoes, which were way cool, and partly because the toes were thinner and they, you could fit them into narrow, narrower cracks. You know, side light on that. This is like a conceptual thing, but hand cracks were the deal in the 60s. And then off hands and fists and off width especially, mainly because Chuck Pratt liked him and he thought of that as a frontier, so it was, because he was the best in the valley. And we all followed what he did. But, you know, we couldn't see, we couldn't see finger cracks. Nobody was trying to climb finger cracks until the 70s. And then all of a sudden, I don't know who did this and how it came about. I actually have to think about it. But but the point is, conceptually, finger cracks were like piton cracks. Okay, nailing it here. And yet now they're one of the coolest crack climbing things you can do. So it's like conceptual breakthrough. It's like going from a bowling to a figure eight. You know, it's somebody figured it out it wasn't about being a good climber so let's segue into having you show us a piton in this random oh, rock yeah, here let's do that. and then placing stoppers from the stopper guy placing gonna, friends yeah and, and watching gonna... your face light up while you do it <laughs> <laughs> yeah being a big kid is always an advantage I wanted to say one more thing about shoes because we were talking about that yeah. progression and, you know, EBs came along and they were just sucked on your feet. They're so hard on your feet because they were real narrow and I have square feet. So anyway, enough of that. But I wore them for a decade and then these Spanish guys showed up in Camp 4 and they had some Spanish shoes that looked funky so people sort of laughed I mean you always laugh at somebody who comes in and they don't know how to climb Yosemite style and plus they have weird gear John Backer didn't laugh he had the beginner's mind and when they showed him their shoes he goes can I try those and he put them on and the rest is history because I mean he became the importer for Firays and then he became the designer for a Copa and I'm still climbing on a Copa shoes and they just came back into this country they're making them again so I'm on the fourth resole of my 
chameleon shoes and I, I get to have new ones because <laughs> they're genius and it's uh, it's because he turned out to be such a good designer you know he was a jerk in a lot of ways and very egotistical but um, he was starting to get over that toward the end of his life he really was making some progress but I'll never forget that like 1983 I'm pretty sure that was the year when these Spaniards showed him their shoes and he goes I'll try those everybody else is laughing in camp for yeah oh silly looking boots <laughs> within a few months they're all wearing them <laughs> because the sticky rubber on them the boots were nothing special but the rubber was incredible um, and you know that like I said maybe a whole number grade for me maybe two or three letter grades but like I was already getting old and didn't matter so much to me it was cutting edge it disappeared over the horizon that's fine that's what it's supposed to do <laughs> but yeah that's that's just the shoe story I wanted to yeah. share a little bit because because it's such a good beginner's mind story like okay I'll try that this is such a fascinating history lesson from <laughs> from the source so that's really fun I, I'm glad you brought the uh, magazine and yeah. there were the catalog the cracking up <laughs> those i actually somebody gave me those and i'm like what are these for <laughs> yeah now i know yeah but um yeah let's make uh the end of whatever episode we made this into uh about <laughs> yeah. finding a, a rock let's and playing around find with a it crack so mr clean has a hammer in his hand that's right we're gonna drive iron <laughs> Steel, actually. Very fine chromium molybdenum steel alloy. An aircraft quality alloy. Alright, so. God, beautiful thing, too. I gotta say, takes me back. So, here's a crack in the rock. The piton goes in about a third of its length is about the right fitting before you start hitting it, okay? Okay, now, especially listen to the sound of this, all right? Because it's starting to tighten up now, and the sound is rising. Oops, sound went down, something happened. Uh-huh. Maybe I, I think we're hitting on the back here. Yeah, we are. Um, that's unfortunate. Let me find another spot. You can redo. Okay. But this, by the way, is how you take them out. Yeah. You're hitting them back and forth. And this is what Stars. destroyed the cracks. Because the granite is chipping away as well as the wedge action of the natural taper of the piton. For the last 60 or 70 or 80 years. <laughs> Yeah, and now we have to have fancy cams just to fit these weird shapes that the pitons created. <laughs> Actually, because the back of the piton is against the rock, there we go. Good job. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's. Yeah, right. yeah. I have to see what else we can find. Is this what it's like establishing new roots? Yeah, and we're looking at a piece of rock here that no climber is ever going to look at, so <laughs> I don't want really to create a new piton scar just to show how this works. Oh, here we go. Okay, that's about tight enough. And you could always tell by hammer bounce off it instead of it's actually moving a little but the hammer bounces off instead of moving the piton oh. hear that sound that's what you want to hear and if you had a carabiner I don't have one on me but um oh thank you yeah so Everybody's carrying carabiners. You come upon a fixed pin and you can 
tap on it and you can hear the sound. And that about the same pitch as you were hearing when I was hitting with him. So you can tell with just a carabiner if a fixed piton is strong enough to trust. Uh, I'd whip on that. Yep. Okay. We'll take it out. Hear the sound going down. And of course, you're just holding a hand jam on an overhanging 510 totally. while doing this two-handed job. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, standing here, I'm like, yeah, cool. But then I'm like realizing the context of where you do this and it's like, hmm. Yeah, that's where it gets like, that's kind of like maybe a limitation in why grades maybe didn't climb, right? You need two hands to do some of this crap. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Or, you know, maybe we'll just stick to aid climbing today. <laughs> I don't need to free this pitch. <laughs> the next piton dem demonstration is going to require a bigger piton. Yeah. But that's the way it worked, too. I'm pretty soon that. you're into an angle piton in the, because it's a pin scar. Yeah. And it's ugly. Yep. Yeah. And that's where... And then you uh, need the tracks I climb. Or I can only climb because they've got pin scars in yeah. my fingers. <laughs> you know, finger lock the holes that didn't exist in the past. Yeah. Pitons. Ancient technology. I'm going to place a stopper here so you can see how that works. There we go. Pretty strong. Would you whip on that? Yeah, I would actually. Do you like having it near the outside here, or do you? No, I I would put it inside, but this is just for so you can see it. Yeah. Gotcha. Put it inside. Let's see what it. If the okay. camera picks it up. Because if I was scared, I would bury that thing. Yeah, totally. <laughs> there we yes. Go. All right. Now we're yes. happy. To, oh yeah, because this is not going to fall out behind me as I'm Man. working the hard move. Aren't you just like super curious what that would break at? <laughs> Very maybe, curious of what that would break at. Maybe we can find out. <laughs> I would guess the rock would break first. Ah, uh, yeah, hundred percent. Because even this spin skinny lip. wire. Because yeah. yeah, skinny wire will give us about eight ish kilonewtons, and that rock. You can see it's rated here for only three. <laughs> yeah, it's really great. Yeah, when, when it, it's uh, the labels on the backside, yeah. the MBS of this granite. <laughs> it's not because we've tested this specific area of rock before. <coughs> this granite, you'd be surprised. It it has that decomposing vibe. Yeah, uh, it definitely does. We actually tested. I forget where we tested pitons. We tested pitons actually. The pull-out strength of pitons. Huh. With the pinging sound and everything. Yeah. I think it was like three kilonewtons. Three is all you got. Is all you get when you pull straight out straight of a pinging. Straight out. Yeah. yeah. I mean, pff, you put it in an sure. angle. Yeah, good lord. You get they don't even really have to hammer it in. 50. Yeah. <laughs> Slot that thing in there. Um, it was like in the 60s, the rumor was the ultimate aid pitch. You didn't have to hit the pins. <laughs> <laughs> Click like and they'll let me out of here. <laughs>